Welcome to today's Bible teaching with Pastor Mike Bernard of Shoreline Community Church in North Bend, Oregon. We hope you will be blessed as we explore the riches of God's Word verse by verse. Please open your Bible and join us for today's message. Here's Pastor Mike. So the title of the message today is going to be the love chapter. We're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verses 1 through 13. And Father, once again, I just want to thank you that we can come here today. I pray that you would remove anything that would distract us from seeing all that you have for us in your word. Lord, I pray that as we go through this, that we would truly come to understand what the kind of agape love is that led to Christ giving all for us. And so I pray that you would just open up the word today, that you would do exactly that which you've promised, and that's that your word will not return void. In Jesus' name, amen. Back in the early 1980s, I had just gotten out of the Army. I was a brand new Christian, and I went back to Fremont, California, and I decided to go back to school. And uh, one of the classes that I took at that point, I took a religion class, which was, was interesting. <laughs> but one of the other things that I decided to do was to take a speech class. And so those of you who have been through speech know how it is. You go through the little speeches that you have for so many minutes. And as we got towards the end of that class, we had to do a longer one. And me being the young Christian, and thinking I had the tiger by the tail, decided that what I was going to teach on on that particular day was the love chapter. So I went ahead and I began to speak on that, and I gave my talk on 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter. And I'll never forget at the end of that class when, when we finished, I was surrounded by a group of Muslim students that were there. And they came in and they started asking me all these questions, and I'm, I'm, I'm sharing with them. And I had the opportunity to talk about Jesus, which was real cool, and then I turned around and there was my teacher. <laughs> my teacher said, you will never speak about religion in this class. <laughs> so that was kind of it for the love chapter in, 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 in my speech class, but I haven't stopped speaking about the love chapter because it's really important to each and every one of us. And today, what we do is it, it, we've been working through 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and in chapters 12 and 14, we see that the main topic in those chapters is spiritual giftedness. And it's no coincidence that right in the middle in chapter 13, we've got the love chapter. Because whenever spiritual gifts are being used, it requires a lot of love. It requires a lot of grace from each and every one of us to keep the unity within the body of Christ. Now, Paul had all kinds of problems that he was learning about with this church in Corinth. They had, in chapter 1, we see... They had division within the, within the church. In chapter 2, we see that there was sectarianism. Some of them wanted to follow Peter. Some of them wanted to follow Paul. Some of them wanted to follow Apollos. They were dividing up into sects. In chapter 4, we see that there was a lack of respect for Paul's apostolic authority. And in chapter 5, we see that there was issues of sexual abuse that would, would uh, just cause us to shudder even today, and yet the church was taking pride in those things that were happening. In chapter 6, we see that there were lawsuits among believers, and you had one believer suing another believer. And in chapter 7, you find they've got marriage problems, and so now Paul's dealing with the marriage problems that are taking place in the city of Corinth. You skip ahead to chapter 11 and you find out that there was problems with the Lord's Supper, that people weren't waiting for one another. They were going into it with the wrong attitude, the wrong heart as they did, and Paul had to address that issue. And then in chapters 12 through 14, we find out that they had a major issue that was going on in that church with the gift of tongues. And so now as we come to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we find that Paul's about ready to give them a story, a, a lesson on love. And maybe that's the lesson that many of us need to hear today. Maybe we haven't been as loving as we should be in some of the relationships that we have. Charles Hodge, in speaking about the church at Corinth, says the Corinthians were impatient. They were discontented, envious, inflated, selfish, indecorous, unmindful of the feelings and the interests of others, suspicious, resentful, and censorous. 
So he had a whole bunch of things that he had to, to deal with this church on. So let's go ahead and dive in. Chapter 13, beginning with verse 1. And Paul writes, Though I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass in a clanging cymbal. Though I speak in the tongues of men and in the tongues of angels. Well, we understand the tongues of men. We can travel all over the world and we hear different uh, dialects that are being spoken, different languages that, that are shared. And so we've got different languages, but it appears that apparently there may have been a language of angels as well. But that whole concept on the, um, that whole concept on the dialects of men, we really see the, the importance of that at Pentecost. If you remember, what would happen is the Jewish people had three feasts during the course of the year. That uh, on those three feasts, you had unleavened bread in the Bible, which is also Passover. You had Pentecost. And then you had tabernacles. During those three feasts, all the Jewish males who were old enough, close enough, and healthy enough were to make the trip to Jerusalem. And so when all of a sudden the gift of tongues came upon the apostles and either they were speaking in the various languages or maybe the miracle was the people hearing that language, it was important because there were people speaking all of these different languages from all over the world who had gathered together there in Jerusalem so that they could hear. You've got the tongues of men, but you also have the tongues of angels. What's interesting is whenever you see angels speaking in the Bible, they speak in the common language of the people that they're communicating with. You don't hear about a special angelic language at that point. You hear them speaking in the language of the people in whom they're communicating with. But Paul also says here the language of angels. But the key here is have not love. I have become a sounding brass and a clanging cymbal. Well, what did Paul mean when he ended up referring to the tongues of angels? There's a couple of possibilities. Number one, Paul may have been referring to a literal, literal language of angels. I don't know that there's anything that would say that there isn't a literal language of angels. But some people would say, so when people are speaking in tongues, that's what they're speaking. They're speaking the language of, of angels. But number two, it's possible that Paul may have been speaking hyperbolically, or in other words, he was, he was intentionally exasper, exaggerating, saying that even if there were a unique language for angels, without love, it would amount to nothing. So I think the key here is that whatever the language is, whatever culture you're talking about, the key here is that we need love. Love is the glue that holds the church together. Love is what's needed. That agape love is what's needed, especially when the spiritual gifts are being used. Quite often what ends up happening when, when spiritual gifts are being used is people focus on that gift that they themselves have, and that takes priority over everything else. Well, agape was actually a rare word for love in the Greek language, and it's said that that maybe it was because they saw it as a sign of weakness. And when you see the definition of agape, maybe you'll understand. Agape love, as I define it here, is a, is, is a self-sacrificial love fully committed to the welfare of others. And in our case, as Christians, being fully committed to the glory of God. So that agape love wouldn't be seen by the Greeks as something as strength, something very strong, what it would be seen as somebody who is sacrificing, in fact, self-sacrificial, looking at the needs of others even more so than they look at the needs of their self. That word, which is so rarely used, is used nine times in chapter 13. That's the point that Paul's making here. That's that godly, Christ-like kind of love that we find within the Word of God. Now, when we look at the English language, we, we use the word love all the time. We write songs on it. We write books on it. Uh, love is used all the time, but we've got one word that's generally used, and that's love. And it's a catch-all word that just kind of encompasses everything. But when we go to the, the Greek language, there's four different words that are used for, for love. The first word that I'm thinking of that would be used would be the word storge, which means affection. The second word that we find being used for, for love, although it's not used in the Bible at all, and not used in the New Testament anyways, is the word eros. Eros would have to do with sexual love or, or sexual intimacy. The third word that we find in the Greek for love is the word phileo. 
And if you look at the spelling on that, it comes out very close to the word Philadelphia. And, and if you were to talk about that word Philadelphia and what it means, what would you say? The city of? City of brotherly love. Because phileo is kind of a brotherly love. It's an affection. And then the fourth word for love is the word that we find used so many times here in chapter 13, which is agape love, that self-sacrificial love fully committed to the welfare of others, and I underline fully committed, and in our cases as Christians, fully committed to the glory of God, that whatever we do, we want to glorify God. Agape love is that glue that holds the body of Christ together as we look out for our friends, we look out for our neighbors, and we want the very best for them. And it's needed especially when it comes to spiritual giftedness. The moment a believer is born again, the moment they come to Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord, at that moment, each and every believer receives at least one spiritual gift. Most of us receive more than one spiritual gift. None of us receive all of the spiritual gifts. Why? Why wouldn't we receive all of the spiritual gifts? Because God wants us interdependent upon one another. You look at the human body and how the human body functions, and you've got the head, and uh, you've got the torso, and, and the legs, and the hands, and there's a function for it. You've got the brain, and the heart, and the liver, and the kidneys. There's a function for everything. And that's how the body of Christ is designed, only we can't see that. There's no big gifts and little gifts. You've got everybody with a gift within the body of Christ that has a design to, to minister. But when we're talking about agape love, it's really important because this is the kind of love that's able to reach out to the society around us. It's the kind of love that drives us to help people who are in their time of need. Verse 2, Paul writes, And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries, all knowledge, faith, so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. You know, we, we realize that those spiritual gifts that we have have been bestowed upon us by God. They are supernatural gifts that are given to us. And some people have incredible gifts. But if I've got all of the gifts in the sense that, that I, I've just super been blessed by God with the spiritual gifts, but I'm lacking that agape love. I'm lacking that love for other people that's going to get in there and be a self-sacrificial love that I'm going to go out there and I'm going to help them. I amount to nothing. You see, love is the mark of the true church. And if we're going to be the true church, then love ought to be a, a, an important part of our everyday life and our everyday ministry. Agape love is a must when it comes to, to using the spiritual gifts. And, and why, would you say, why would I say that? I said that everyone has at least one. Most people have more. But I want you to look around, and you, even in your experiences in ministry, what you'll find is people tend to gravitate to the area of their giftedness. And what becomes the most important to them is that area of giftedness. If somebody has the gift of evangelism, they're going to want everything to be evangelism. You know, if somebody's got the, the gift of teaching, they're going to want everything to be teaching. And what we need to do is we need to have that grace and love and self-sacrifice to let people use their gifts within the body of Christ so we can come together and portray that picture, which is Jesus Christ in all of his glory. Verse 3, Paul continues and he says, And though I bestow all my gifts to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. You see, God doesn't care so much about how much money we have. What God cares about is our heart. In fact, we can't give our way to heaven. We can't earn our way to heaven. We can't just want our way to heaven. There's only one way to heaven, and that's by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. We need to realize that whatever we have is a gift from God and be very grateful for that which he's given to us. It's not about religion. It's not about the things we do. It's about relationship. You can go to some parts of the world today and there's extreme forms of flagellation. Uh, but I got to tell you, flagellation won't get us to heaven. A love of Christ will. You might be shocked to go to the, the Philippines and there's at times where people gather together and they go through crucifixion and, and, and literally the nails are put through their hands, the nails are put through their feet. They do it as an act of devotion. I don't think that's what Jesus ever intended. I, I think Jesus came and he died for our sins. 
He came and he died once and for all so that we can be forgiven of our sins and we can have eternal life. But annually in the Philippines, people line up as an act of relig religious devotion and they literally go through being crucified. They don't go to the point of death, but they go through being crucified and they hang on that cross for a while thinking that they are honoring God by the things in which he's doing. Now, we need to understand that there's a difference between religion and relationship. It's interesting that as you go into Bible colleges, it used to be the theology department that you'd walk into. But today, they're changing that name theology department to the religion department. And there's a huge difference there because theology is the study of God. Religion properly belongs in the category of anthropology, which is the study of man. It's the things in which man do. We are not saved by doing anything. We're saved by a relationship with Jesus Christ. He did it for us. He's the one who died on the cross so that we can be forgiven. And what, a, what an abuse to come and suffer like this. How, I, I, my heart goes out to those people. They just don't realize what it is they're doing as they hang up there on crosses and think that they're honoring the Lord by doing that. In verse 3b, Paul continues and he says, Though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Though I give my body to be burned. Do people in other, do people in other religions die for their, their faith? Absolutely. So it's not something unique that's to Christianity. What is unique to Christianity is a relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's through that relationship that we end up coming to salvation. You see, the question we need to ask ourselves is, why do we do the things that we do? Are we doing the things to truly honor the Lord? Are we doing the things to bring attention upon ourselves or to bring glory to God? In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, we see that uh, Paul, Paul writes, he says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. I think we're really blessed that as Christians we don't have to worry about going through the great white throne judgment or that ultimate judgment at the end times. But we, make no mistake about it, we will be judged. And the judgment that we're going to end up going through is that judgment seat of Christ. Now, what is the difference? The great white throne judgment at the end times is that final judgment for those who have rejected Christ. The judgment seat of Christ is that judgment that's going to examine the things that we've done over the course of our life, whether good or bad, to see what was the motivation of our hearts as we did these things. That's where the rewards for all eternity end up coming out. And we need to, to realize that as, as we do this, are we doing these things that we do in ministry to honor ourselves, to build up our reputation, or are we doing these things to honor Christ and, and, and exalt his name? Well, we're going to go before that judgment seat of Christ one of these days. You see, agape love, we need to live out of our faith, and we need to live out that faith out of a heart that desires to follow God. One of my heroes of the faith is D.L. Moody, and he was back in the 1800s, but one of the, the statements that he made is, every Bible should be bound in shoe leather. Let me say that again. Every Bible should be bound in shoe leather. Now, some of you look at my Bible and you say, yeah, it's kind of worn out. It's uh, kind of a little ragtag. And when you rebind that Bible, we should put it in shoe leather? Really? Is that what Moody is telling us? I don't think so. What Moody is saying when we read our Bible, we need to get that Bible into our head. And it's got to get from our head to our heart. And then it's got to get from our heart to our shoes. And every Bible should be bound in that shoe leather as we walk out our faith and we live our faith in a genuine way within the world, realizing that we are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Well, Paul, in verses 4 through 8, begins to uh, personify this, this whole topic of love, and he begins to bring out the characteristics of agape love. Uh, it's interesting that in this little four-verse section, he's got 14 different illustrations or 14 different descriptions that are here of what agape love is, and seven of them are positive, seven of them are negative. Verse 4, he says, agape love, and I keep adding that word agape to let you know that's what the Greek word is that I'm, I'm translating here because there are different words. Agape love is patient, or agape love suffers long and is kind. 
so often people think that if they come to Christ, that that's going to end their problems. Everything's going to be cool and, and come together. But I got to tell you, when you come to Christ, you just opened up a can of worms because Satan is really upset. He had you where he wanted you before, and now you've come to faith in Christ. And so you can, you can expect those attacks to come. If you're walking faithfully with Jesus Christ, you're going to be attacked by the enemy. We're, we're promised that. In fact, Jesus promised us not health. He didn't promise us wealth. What he did promise us is that we'll suffer for walking with him. In John chapter 15, verse 18, Jesus said, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Now, when I'm talking about the world, I'm not talking about that globe that we call the world. I'm talking about the people within the world. I'm talking about the world system. And if the world hates you, you're not alone. You know that it hated me before it hated you. And in John chapter 15, verse 20, Jesus said, Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep your word also. Agape love suffers long and is still kind, even in spite of it. Well, agape love does not envy. And I looked at the definition in Webster's of envy. And Webster's de defines it this way. Discontent or jealousy, excited by the sight of another's superiority or success, a feeling that makes a person begrudge another, another his good fortune, uh, resentment, malice, object of envy. Or in other words, we shouldn't be envious at the success of others. Over the years that we've been a church, we've had a, a lot of really neat things happen, and we've had some, some individuals in, in this church have been, uh, they've become the South Coast Teacher of the Year. Uh, Karen Brown uh, became the, the School Nurse of the Year for the entire state of Oregon. We had another young lady that was in here who uh, went to the state finals on soloists uh, for, the, for the high school division. And we had another lady that was here as well who was, uh, she, she was uh, given the, the award as the Ombudsman of the Year for the entire Coast Guard. And I got to tell you, when things like that happen, as the body of Christ, we are one family. And we want to celebrate that. We, we, we want to just come alongside and say, praise the Lord. That is absolutely awesome. And I got to tell you, each of those people who earned those special awards uh, wouldn't brag about it. But I mean, it's nice for us to come along and, and, and just bless them for being blessed and for what they've gone through. But we could say the same for Christians, can't we? We, we look at Christians and, and all of a sudden you see God tremendously blessing a particular believer and sometimes we get jealous. Sometimes we get upset. Why is God blessing them? God's not blessing me. What's going on? Or you look at churches in the community and you say, why is God blessing that church? And God's not blessing our church. What's, what's going on here? And yet we're one body, aren't we? And we come around that we're not to envy. We're to come together as one body. We're to celebrate the victories that one has within that body. Well, agape love doesn't parade itself. In other words, when it's agape love, the focus isn't on me. The focus should be upon God. And agape love remains humble like Jesus did and made sure that God the Father got all of the glory. Agape love is not puffed up or proud. You know, we, we really have nothing to be proud about. We, we, we look at ourselves and, and we say, well, I don't know. I've, I've done pretty good over the course of my life. You know, I was able to go to school and get all of these degrees. And now I've gone up. I've worked really hard to get to where I'm at. And I've got this job. And, and, and I, 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 I have done these things. But I'll tell you what. God has done it in us. If we've got the brain the intellect to be able to go to school and understand all these things, praise the Lord. The Lord gave you a gift to be able to do that. If you worked really hard at the job that you've got, praise the Lord. The Lord gave you the health to be able to do that. And he's working behind us all of the time. And if we just really understand anything that we have is a gift from God. And we ought to be, be thankful for all that he's done because it's not us. Romans chapter 3 verse 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If we were to get what we deserve, what we deserve is God's wrath and not his mercy. And yet he's given us his mercy and he's given us his blessings. Number five, agape love does not behave rudely. 
Christians are ambassadors of Jesus Christ, and I think we need to keep in mind that when we're talking to people, people are watching. It took me a, a long time to learn that as Christians, we live in a fishbowl. And in fact, when people find out that you are a Christian, some of them are hoping that you're going to fall right on your face, and they begin watching you more closely than you ever imagined with that hope. But we're ambassadors for Jesus Christ, so it's important for us to remember and to live our lives in such a way that brings honor and glory to God. Agape love does not seek its own, but it puts the needs of others above our own at times. How about your marriage? How are you doing at that? Do you look at your, your wife or your husband and do you put their needs even above your own? How about your family, your children, your grandchildren? Do you put their needs even above your own. What about your friends or coworkers, or even strangers that you meet out on the street? The thing about agape love is it's a self-sacrificial love in which we set everything aside so that for God and for God's glory, we're ministering to the needs of these other people. Agape love is not provoked, and what that means is easily angered or irritated. It's the kind of, of love that keeps no record of wrongs. Are you one of these people that something happens years and years ago and you never, ever, ever forget? When the opportunity comes up in your marriage, you pull out that, even though you've said it's been forgiven before, you pull it out and it's right front and center again. I, uh, I'm from Toronto, Canada. I, I grew up loving hockey and uh, um, I actually got to go to a hockey game back in Toronto when I was eight years old, and that was back in the days when goalies didn't even wear masks, if you can imagine that. So they were crazy back then. But uh, one of my heroes back then was an individual by the name of Gordy Howe, and until Wayne Gretzky came along, Howe had all, all the records, and, and he, was a, he was a tough guy. But I just read a biography on him, and he's telling what it used to be like in the early days in the NHL, and he said he never forgot when somebody wronged him. In fact, what he did is he kept a list. So if somebody took a cheap shot at him in one of the corners when he went in there, he had that man's name. And he might wait for two months, he might wait for three months, and as soon as that man had an open shot at him, he was going to nail him, and he did, sometimes breaking jaws. And I thought, you know, that's not exactly what agape love is, is it? <laughs> because on agape love, you've got to let it go. When, when you say it's done, you let it go, and it's gone. In Matthew chapter 18, Jesus taught this principle to Peter and to his disciples. And Peter came to him on one day, and, and he, he said to Jesus, he said, Lord, how shall my brother sin against me? How often shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him. Up to seven times? Peter's feeling pretty good about himself. I'm going to be generous. I've said I've forgiven him. Up to seven times? How about that, Lord? And Jesus responds, and he says this. He said, I do not say to you, up to seven times, but I say to you, up to 70 times seven. Well, that's pretty good, 490 times. That sounds like that would work. Now, have you ever, have you ever taken a look, even put yourself in that position and asked yourself how many times you've had to ask the Lord for forgiveness? And I'll tell you if, you, if we're really walking close with God, if we're judging the acts we're doing, there's probably hardly a day that ever goes by where a couple of times during the day we don't ask the Lord for forgiveness for something that we've done or something that we've thought. And I've got to tell you that 490 times goes by really, really quick. Is that what Jesus was saying? Okay, Peter, just 490 times. Is that what he was saying? No, he was saying, you forgive indefinitely. And that's the principle that's being taught is that the person with agape love, when it's gone, it's gone. And when we forgive, we forgive indefinitely. Well, agape love thinks no evil. In fact, agape love thinks the best of other people. It desires to see the best for them. Verse 6, agape love does not rejoice in iniquity. And iniquity means sin. It means wickedness. Listen to that. Agape love does not rejoice in iniquity. I don't know how many times I've talked to people over the years, and I think it's something that we as Christians really need to watch out for. One of the things that all of us should do is give our testimony of where we were and where we've come to. But I don't know how many times I've talked to people that when they begin to go back to where they were and the things in which they used to do and the lifestyle in which they used to live, that pride begins to well up on how bad they were. We don't want to do that. 
We don't take pleasure. Agape love doesn't take pleasure in iniquity. It doesn't take pleasure in wickedness. And in fact, agape love doesn't rejoice when somebody ends up falling spiritually because of sin. I knew they were going to do that. I'm glad they went down. Now, agape love doesn't do that. Agape love, in fact, would, would cover that up. Agape love rejoices in the truth. And in fact, we find that, that Jesus Christ is the truth. In John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Verse 7 says, agape love bears all things. In fact, the Greek word there can be translated covers. And so it covers the shortcomings of others. We look at the individual of, of Noah, and Noah was an incredible man. In fact, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And as you see that man, he and his family were able to survive through the flood. But after the flood was over, a horrible thing ended up happening. This man who was so righteous, this man who was so God, godly, all of a sudden we find out that he's stone cold drunk. He is passed out. And we pick up the story here in Genesis chapter 9, verses 22 through 23. And Ham, the father of Canaan, and Canaan's brought in because the curse is going to go to him. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and he told his two brothers outside. So he comes out, he finds Noah. Noah's totally passed out. He's, he's bare naked as a jaybird, laying there. And Ham comes out, he says, ah, you ought to see the old man. He's stone cold drunk. In fact, he's not even dressed. But it says, but Shem and Jeph uh, Japheth took a garment. And both of them, they laid, they laid it on their shoulders, and they went backwards, and they covered the nakedness of their father. You see, Noah, in his drunkenness, had lost all of his dignity, and his sons were going to make sure that they were, at least two of his sons, that they were going to give that honor and that dignity back to their father. And it says here, their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness. Now, you might wonder, how can a man like Noah who's righteous in the eyes of the Lord, a man who found grace in the eyes of the Lord, all of a sudden becomes stone-cold drunk and pass out nakedly on the floor. We talk a lot today about PTSD, don't we? Post-traumatic stress syndrome. I want you to imagine that you were Noah. I want you to imagine that you preached to the people for 100 years that this flood was going to come. I want you to imagine that you got into the ark as the rain began to fall, and he's looking outside at all of the people screaming to let him in. And, and, and watching all of those people perish. I have to wonder if maybe there was a little bit of that that was going on in his mind. But either way, either way, he got to that point. He messed up. One son celebrated the sin, made fun of it. The other two ended up with dignity, covering up their father. Why do I give this illustration? Because it's so easy for us when we see other Christians mess up to celebrate in the fall especially if you've had issues with them before. We're not to do that, as it says here in the original Greek, that we are to cover it. We are to cover up not illegal things, not bad, bad things type, type, but we are to cover it up. In other words, we are to help somebody because we want the best for them spiritually. We're to help them to be able to get back on their feet again. Well, agape love believes all things, not the foolish things, but it believes the truth of God's word, no matter what circumstances we may be going through at that particular time. One of the things that, that really impacted me is I was listening to the radio one day, and David Jeremiah was on there, and he talked about his childhood. And he said, when I was a young child, what my parents used to do is we'd come to, together around the dinner table, and my parents would get a basket, and they got a book, apparently, of the Bible promises. In fact, you can go online and find a, a Bible promise book. They got a book of Bible promises, and they cut up all of the promises of the Bible, and they put it into that basket. Every night around the dinner table, what the kids would do is they would grab one piece of paper which had one of those promises on, and that's what they would focus on before they ended up saying grace for the meal. Can you imagine the impact over the years that a practice like that can make upon a family as the, the kids start to memorize and understand those promises that God has given to them? Well, Agape love hopes all things. Believe in God even in spite of your circumstances. And agape love also is demonstrated that when you see a friend who's going through difficulties, that you're there as well to help and to share the love of Christ with them. Agape love endures all things. 
even when times get tough. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 says this, and we know that all things, does it say some things? Some things in your life? All things. And we know that all things, what are you going through right now? All things work together for good. For who? Everyone? To those who love God. Those who are the called according to his purpose. It's important for you and me to remember that we trust God. We trust his word. And we're going through difficulties in our life. It's not a surprise to God that in all things, God is at work in our life. Verse 8 goes on, agape love never fails. You see, people will let you down, but God never will. So Paul continues in Romans 8, verses 35 through 37, and he says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? I mean, you're going through hard times. Who's going to separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And then in verse 38 and 39, Paul continues, he said, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor debt, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What are you going through right now? Do you feel a little bit lonely in your life with the problems and the challenges that you've got? Do you realize how much the Lord loved you? He left heaven. He came to this earth at the incarnation. He lived the sinless life to go to the cross to die for you. And Paul says, look, there's nothing in all creation that will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We don't have to go through it together. Well, agape love, that self-sacrificial love, should be the mark of every Christian. It certainly was with, with Jesus. And Paul personifies, as I said, agape love in verses 4 through 8. What I'd like you to do, I wonder if you would go ahead and we can all read this together. And you're familiar with this passage, but let's do it together. Love suffers long and is kind. Love that does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, love never fails. And when I do weddings quite often, I'll quote from the love chapter. But my question is, is how about Jesus? How did Jesus do when it came to that agape love? And I'm going to go ahead and punch his name in here, and I'll read this for you. Jesus suffered long and was kind. Jesus did not envy. Jesus did not parade himself. He didn't promote himself. Jesus was not puffed up. He did not behave rudely. He did not seek his own. He came to earth and died for us. He was not provoked. In other words, he wasn't ready to fight at a moment's notice. Jesus thought no evil. He did not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoiced in the truth. Jesus bore all things. He believed all things that were true, hoped all things, endured all things. Jesus never failed. What would you say? Did Jesus demonstrate agape love in a very accurate way in the way in which he lived his life? Now I'm going to make it a little bit more personal because we're going to check it out for us. And I've got you here, and what I want you to do as I read through here, I want you just to plug your name in, and we'll see how we're doing. You suffer long, and you're kind, even when people aren't to you. You do not envy. You don't want that new car, that new house. You do not parade yourself. You are not puffed up. You do not behave rudely. You've never been rude to a person. You do not seek your own. Are you thinking about your own kingdom rather than God's? You are not easily provoked. Do you become angry when people get angry, when people get on your nerves? You think no evil. 
Really? Do you think about evil with other people? You do not rejoice in iniquity, but you rejoice in the truth. You bear all things. You believe all things. You hope all things. You endure all things. You ready for this now? You never fail. Let me ask you this. How are you doing at that? If you're like me, there's a little bit of work that needs to take place in our lives so that we become like Christ. And I think, I'm so glad that he hasn't given up on us because the goal is to be Christ-like with that agape love. You see, a communicable, a communicable attribute is an attribute of God that can be communicated to human beings. It can be communicated to us. What's an incommunicable attribute? Well, an incommunicable attribute of God would be God's omnipresence. It would be his, his omnipotence, his, his all-powerfulness. It would be uh, his omniscience, his all-knowing, that he knows all things. Those are, are all incommunicable attributes. They belong to God and God alone, not to us. But some of the attributes, like God's love, can come to us. And agape love from God is such an attribute. As we grow older in our relationship with Christ, agape love should become more and more evident within our life because God is love. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, John says, He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. It's part of who he is. And that's who we need to be too. That when people look at the church, they don't see a bunch of hypocrites, but that they see people who truly love God and truly love others. Verse 8b continues, But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, that knowledge will vanish. In other words, he, he pulls out three spiritual gifts here, and he says, Look, where, where you've got these gifts, there's going to come a time and a place in which all of these gifts, they cease. They, they stop being manifested for a, for a reason. But the need for love, because God is love, will never fail. It will never stop. Verse 9, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. It's funny, you talk to people and they get so angry at God when things don't go their way. And it's amazing to me that, that we can sit here and we can tell God exactly what we want him to do, what we think he should do. And when he doesn't do those things that we think that he should do, he gets, that we get angry at God. Rather than getting angry at God, who we should be getting angry at is we should be getting angry at the enemy, who's the one who's in here stirring things up. And so we end up getting angry at God, and we want to tell him what to do. Think about it. God created the heavens and the earth. We can just scratch the surface on what we can see in the heavens, and I don't even know that we can fully understand what's at the bottom of the sea. Yet in these little walnuts that we have that we call brains, we want to tell the God of this universe what he can do and what he can't do. And we need to, to back off and we need to trust God. We know in part. We don't know everything. What we do know is what God has chosen in his infinite wisdom to reveal to you and me. And when he speaks to us, he speaks to us in anthropomorphic terms, the language of man, because that's what we understand. And we can only know what he's given to us. Verse 10 continues and it says, And when that which is perfect, we've known in part, but when that which is perfect, the NIV says perfection, when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part will be done away with. For years the question has come up, what is that which is perfect? And there's three main interpretations to that. The first one, some believe that perfect refers to the completion of the New Testament canon. So what we've been waiting for is just the completion of the Bible. Once the completion of the Bible comes, that which is perfect is here. There's no more need for the gifts, no more need for revelation. Absolutely wrong. I don't believe that for, for one moment. And all you got to do is look around the world and we're anything but perfect. Secondly, we go to number two. Others believe that perfect is the second coming of Christ and the final event in God's plan of redemption and revelation. But most today believe that that which is perfect refers to the eternal state, that it refers to the new heavens and the new earth when we're face to face with God and everything comes to its consummation. That would be that which is perfect. Verse 11, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. I think there's a maturing process for each and every one of us. I, I was thinking just the other day when, when we were young, I was, I was really young, some of the stupid things that I did 
And I bet you if you guys think back when you were young, you did some things that you're kind of embarrassed about now. You'd never do them at this point in your life. Why? Because you've been maturing. You've, you've changed from where you were. Those things were childish. But today you've gone to the point in which you're mature. And the same is true spiritually. As, as physically, we're, we're growing and we're changing. But the same is true spiritually in the sense that as we grow spiritually, we shouldn't be today where we were a year ago. There should be noticeable growth that's going on in our lives because we, we are growing. We're no longer a child. We're putting away those childish things. And now we're becoming men and women. Verse 12, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am also known. Paul, as he, he does so frequently, he'll, he'll go to things that, that relate to the people that he's writing to. If you were to go in Corinth, one of the things you would find out is that they were famous for the bronze mirrors that they had. They would shine up the metal and, and you would look at it and you could see the reflection, although it wasn't a perfect reflection. And so immediately he goes to something they understand. He goes immediately to the mirrors on here. And, uh, uh, but, but he says, now I see as in a mirror, dimly, not clearly, but then, face to face. So today, all we have is a poor reflection of what we're going to see in heaven one of these days. But Paul says, then face to face, when we can see God face to face, when we can see heaven in all of its splendor, in all of its majesty, the very presence of God with thousands upon thousands of angels, 10,000 times 10,000 angels. Can you imagine the beauty of that moment? In 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, John writes, he said, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we should be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. What does that mean? We are children of God. Do you realize how precious that is to have that title, that we are a child of God? And it hasn't even been revealed to us yet what we're going to be in all of its fullness. But we know when he is revealed, when Jesus is revealed, and we shall be like him. And we're going to see him as he is. We see in the book of Exodus that Moses writes, no man can see God and live because of the sin that takes place within our lives. Well, that day is coming when we go to eternity that we shall see him as he is. What a precious gift we have coming. And then Paul finishes verse 13. Here he says, And now abide faith, hope, love, these things, but the greatest of these is love. These three characteristics, well, what are they? Faith trusts in the promises of God. Hope looks with confidence to the day when the promises of Scripture will be fulfilled. But love self-sacrificially commits to the welfare of others, putting their needs in front of our own. You see, agape love is a communicable attribute of God, and it's caring for the needs of others. Think about that. Love, agape love is a self-sacrificial love, fully committed to the welfare of others, in our case, as Christians, fully committed to the glory of God. The picture I just saw on, on Facebook, and I had to put it up here because I, I, I don't know, is it wrong for a pastor to go up and slap somebody across the head because I thought about it? <laughs> this, this poor lady's got to be in her 90s, and she's on a public transit uh, train. And these young kids with the headsets on and their, their cell phones won't give her a seat, and she's struggling there. I've got to tell you, agape love is a self-sacrificial love, fully committed to the welfare of others. In our case as Christians, fully committed to the glory of God. If we're in a situation where we can help somebody, we need to get off of our tails and go help that person. We need to share the love of God with them in any way that we can. And, and it's the little things that count. It's the little things that make a huge impact upon people. Verse 13 and now abide faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. And the question is asked, why? Because God is love. Love's a divine quality. Love never fails. And when we talk about the ultimate love, we're talking about the love of Jesus Christ who would leave heaven and come to this earth to die for you and me, to sacrifice for us. What a Savior. And we're called to imitate that love as we go out into the world and to be Christ-like. 
So, young man, I used to be a huge fan of the Beatles. You guys would have laughed at me. Back in Canada, I'd, I'd, I'd be in the garage with my guitar, being Paul McCartney, singing along and everything. And we got word in 1964, just before I moved here, that the Beatles were going to be on the Ed Sullivan Show. Now, maybe some of you remember that day, and uh, it was a big deal. So our family gathered together. We went over to a family member's house. And back in those days, televisions were just coming out. Only a few people had them. And so we went over there, and they had a little television room, and all of us crammed in there to hear the Beatles, and we're just going crazy as America's going crazy with the Beatles. And I love their music. But I got to tell you, my opinion changed over the years. In fact, my opinion in, on John Lennon in particular is I came to find out that he, he mocked Jesus Christ. He mocked Jesus Christ even in some of the songs in which he sang. And Lennon wrote, he said, Christianity will go. It will vanish and shrink. I needn't even argue that. I'm right and will be proved right. We are more popular than Jesus. Did you catch that from the Beatles? We are more popular than Jesus, Lennon said. I don't know which is going to go first, rock and roll or Christianity. Well, the music of the Beatles continues on, and you can hardly turn on a radio station without listening to it. And one of the mega hits that John Lennon ended up writing was the song, Imagine. And I used to love this beautiful ballad, and it would come on the radio, and I'd be singing along with it until I finally listened to the words. And I want to just caution you now. So often we'll listen to songs, we enjoy the song by the sound of the song, but we need to stop and listen to the words that are being sung. And sometimes when you do that, you're going to be absolutely shocked by what you hear. And even more so, every year uh, as the new year comes in, normally, I, I cheat here on the, the West Coast, I turn it on at 9 o'clock and I watch it there and then I go to bed. Okay, I'm Canadian. Canadians go to bed at 9. <laughs> so, but, but I watch it. But one of the things that they do, everybody's waiting and you're waiting for the ball to, to, to drop so that everybody can cheer in the new year. And there's this massive roar as the new year arrives and the confetti's going everywhere. And then the very next thing that you'll hear on the TV is John Lennon's Imagine. It begins to play every single year in New York. You hear that song, Imagine, as if it's this wonderful dream of what the, the next year is going to be like. What do the words say in Imagine? Look at the very first ones. Imagine that there's no heaven. Wow, is that something you would look forward to heaven this year? Imagine that there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us. Really? So there's no heaven. There's no hell in this idealistic culture. Above us only sky. Now look at this. Imagine all the people living for today. It sounds almost like the United States, doesn't it? Everybody wants right now. We're, we're the me generation. We want it right now. And everything's all about us. Imagine all the people living for today. Imagine there's no countries, there's no, no borders, no walls, no nothing. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for. And then here you go. And no religion, too. What kind of society you want to live in? Imagine all the people living in peace. You may say that I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will be as one. Is that a beautiful ballad of love and of unity? Or is that talking about hell on earth in which people do whatever it is that they want to do with no eternal hope as there's no heaven? And uh, that's every year you watch, that's what we begin the new year with singing, that that's the dream that we're desiring. Well, I've got to tell you, if Lennon didn't believe in Jesus, he does now. Because an assassin's bullet took him nearly 30 years ago, and he's since had to answer for that song. But can you imagine... What the world would be like if every Christian lived in agape love. Wouldn't it be an incredible place where you look out for the welfare of others even more so than you look out for the welfare of yourself? Can you imagine what it's going to be like when we get to the eternal state and we see God in all of his glory and all of his majesty and all evil is gone and, and, and all that's left is the presence of God, God's people in love, an agape love, this kind of love that we saw that Jesus so fulfilled, that agape love love, that, that it's a self-sacrificial love, fully committed to the welfare of others, and in our case as Christians, fully committed to the glory of God. Jesus said in John chapter 15, verses 12 through 13, 
He said, this is my commandment, that you love one another. As I have loved you, how did Jesus love us? He came here and he gave his life for us. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one life for his friends. Can you imagine if we as Christians truly lived with agape love? What a different world it would be. How are you doing at loving your spouse? How are you doing at loving your children and grandchildren? What about that pesky neighbor? How about that person that you're working with that you're having trouble with? Are you willing to put your desire on the side to see those people reached with the love of Christ, if at all possible? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word, and I thank you for the challenges that come our way. And I know that when, when I read verses 4 through 8, I realized just how far I have to go in regards to that agape love. And I'm thankful that you are long-suffering, Lord, that you haven't given up on us. And I ask that, Lord, that you would come into our hearts and lives and help us to be the kind of people, Lord, that you desire for us to be, that we might reflect the love of Christ to the world around us. Lord, today, if there's anyone here who's never received Jesus as Savior, I pray that they wouldn't walk out of this building without doing so right now because there's nothing more important in all of life, in all of eternity, than to know Jesus, to love him, to serve him. And I pray right now, if somebody would like to do it, that they would pray a prayer like this, realizing it's not a magical formula, Lord, but a state of the heart. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. Lord, I've done many sins. I've messed up in a lot of ways. I ask for your forgiveness. Lord, I repent. I change direction. I ask that you come into my heart and life. Lord, help me once again to be that kind of person that you want me to be so that my life is exemplified by agape love. In Jesus' name, amen.